Young ladies, that he loves you is he respects you. The very thing that the world tells you to give him so you can keep him could be the very thing that causes you to lose him because he lost it. You have, you can't, it's love and respect. It's all through scripture, love and respect, love and respect. You can't love someone you don't respect. How old I was, like 12 years and how many months or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. I was 12. I was I was not a teenager yet. And I told when I was 17 and it did go all the way through my 16th, you know, through the full year of being 16. Um, I don't recall if we saw each other during the year of 1987, those first two and a half months. But when I did tell, um, you know, one of the things I'm sure you read that was he told me the very first time, you can't tell anyone because it will ruin everything. And as a 12 year old, I had no idea what that meant. And as I, you know, grew and got older, I still didn't really know what it meant because when I told, I felt like it ruined everything in my life. It ruined everything in my family's life. All of them, they were very close family friends. And so was the other family that I involved in telling uh, the, the lady that was my mother's close friend and her kids were our age. People have been a little confused about that story, but um have been very chaotic. A lot has come out in media about your story. You have shared very openly. What has it been like for you since your story came out so broadly? Um, it has definitely been busy. I have lots of messages that I, I try to read all my private messages that I've been receiving. I've done, as you know, quite a few interviews. Um, in the beginning, it was maybe a little bit rattling because I haven't ever had that kind of exposure to media. But I also just have such a conviction about doing this. So I have had an incredible amount of support and I think that's what's kept me going. So Yeah. And you know, you have you have shared over the years. You have told people your story over the years. This obviously is a different level of that because it's been picked up by many outlets. As you said, you've done a number right. of interviews. What what changed in you, and maybe nothing did change, but what led you most recently to share so openly, knowing that it was going to have a bigger footprint this time? Well, like you said, I have been sharing. I think I started out just when I was in my 20s sharing with friends or, you know, when it, something might come up, share my story, not even fully grasping what my story was at that time and really dug into counseling and um, just focused on trying to understand what happened to me because of the connection with Robert and Debbie and the family and the family closeness and friends along with church. And um, after I was probably about 35 when I really understood the depth and magnitude of what Robert really did, not just to me, but to my family with all the grooming. And then of course, the sexual abuse and the emotional abuse, the mental, I mean, just it's every part of your being is manipulated during these, that, that kind of abuse. So at 35, when I was able to actually accept the term sexual molestation and that he abused me because it sounded so mean. And I would tell my counselor, but he wasn't mean to me. And she said, it doesn't have to be mean. And I um, heard the term actually on Oprah that instead of calling them child molesters, we should call them child seducers. And when I heard all that description, that's when I started being a lot more vocal about my story. And like most believers, you don't want to do anything that's going to tarnish the name of God. And you're not going to, you don't want to tarnish the church. You don't want to hurt other believers. You don't want to, you know, cause another person to not come to Jesus. And so I never wanted it to be a big exposing, you know, I just wanted someone in leadership somewhere take him out of the pulpit because we did not feel as a family that that's where he should be in leadership. When you can't even fill out a document, honestly, about working in your own church nursery, should you really be in the pulpit? And so anytime he would speak in a church that we were associated with or going to um, in any way, either I would or my parents or my sister would go um, and confront leadership and talk to them and explain to them what happened to our family and to me. And not once has any leadership stood up and said, this isn't biblical. You should not be in leadership. Honestly, you're, you should be gracious to this family and not be that you're not in prison. But no one has taken him out of leadership, ever considered it, it sounds like. So as I've told my story along the way, um, I met someone who's now retired pastor. Um, he has been retired for a couple of years. He heard my story. So, uh, so like, as you can see, Cindy, right? Like she's sharing this story. 
Uh, apparently, she had been talking about this all along. And even the letters that have come out, right, is showing that there was this interaction happened with the lawyer. That was like way back. So it's not that she wasn't talking about it. She was talking about and reaching out to people. But I guess like, you know, for some reason, it never, uh, nothing materialized, right? Nothing ever happened uh, with it. So now, and when Robert Morris, he was actually scheduled to retire uh, this, I think this summer or this spring, you know, just when he was just like, he was just about to retire. And then all this just came tumbling down. Like he's been canceled, Desta canceled him. His own Robert Ministry Ministries canceled him. You know what I'm saying? So I can imagine like you're almost like at the finish line and then you fall. You know what I mean? Like now every single thing that you work for, everything else is gone. You know? I, I mean, I can imagine like for him, he's just like, man, because he had already planned to retire and this is what happened, you know? So very... Uh, very, very sad. And then this is a similar situation with uh, with Ravi Zacharias, right? Everything just right there at the end. And these are the things that happen, right? Like uh, sin would do, the, uh, would do that to you, would do that to you. But uh, let's uh, listen to some more guys. Southern Baptist Convention to um, expose clergy that are abusive, especially to children. And he has a friend that, Dee Parsons, the lady that has the Wartburg watch posts or blog. And he encouraged me to reach out to her and share my story because they still work together to expose and, and get this out of church. It really should be out of everywhere. We shouldn't have it at all in our world, but you know, anything we can all do to work together. And um, statistics show that people that abuse children typically don't stop. So that's well, always a I... concern as well. Can I ask you something? Because you, so you agreed, you did that interview um, mm -hmm. and that interview went very wide. Did you have any idea? Because what you were describing is a situation where you and your family were going when you were seeing that this particular pastor was out there, Robert right. Morris was out there getting a new position or going somewhere. You would go out there and you would let people know. And you said that people, nobody really stepped up to the plate to stop that at, at right. all along that way. So did you have any idea that when you did this particular interview that it was going to have such a monumental effect? I mean, he has since resigned from his position. It is, right. it is one of the biggest faith stories of the year at this point. Right. Did you have any idea it would be that big of a story? I mean, I, I, I did. I think because his church is one of, if not the largest me mega church in the U.S. And um, anytime you have that kind of publicity in anything, I think something like this is going to cause an uproar. Um, I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because for such a time as this, I don't, all I can explain is God's timing has aligned. I would never have been prepared for this myself, um, any sooner, I don't think. So I'm 54 years old and I just, I know that my maturity level, just being a mom of, you know, trying to protect my own children, I could not have walked this path that I'm walking today any sooner, I don't think. So I do believe that God's timing is part of it. And, and I do believe that he's going to use it probably to reveal even bigger things. I don't know. There's things that are starting to come out of the woodwork. So we'll see. I just hope and pray there aren't a whole lot of other you know, victims. But that's part of it, too, is if there are, get help. Come on. You know, let's let's get on the journey to recovery because it is lifelong. Well, that is true. Uh, uh, things coming out of woodwork for sure. Right. Things coming out of uh, woodwork. This is exactly what's going to happen. But all in all, hopefully... Uh, gateway with the investigation, even they are conducting, they are going to set their household in order. They're going to use that as a learning curve, even other churches, right? Because we have other pastors also left and right, right? Different churches. So we'll share that with you guys. That, man, ever since this story happened, it's like the front gates have opened, right? Left and right, uh, pastors are just getting exposed. So, yeah. Like what somebody says over there, like God is purging, right? Purge the evil among you. But let's uh, continue to watch. And, and many people, you know, are afraid to speak out. They're afraid to share. One thing with, with you, you and your family is you have, again, you have openly talked about this. You've right. tried to get people to listen. And sometimes it takes hearing other people sharing their story for people to come out and share what happened yeah. to them, as you were just saying. Um, you know, I want to talk about your faith in a moment, because that is a part of the story that we have not heard a lot about. But it was something I immediately noticed seeing your interviews, hearing you speak mm -hmm. out. 
when when your interview came out, though, before we get there, the interview comes out, there was a response from Robert Morris in which right. he talked about this past you know, incident. He sort of made it sound, he used the term young lady, I believe twice in his statement. You've commented on this, but I have to ask you about it. After all that has gone on, um, all of the conversations you've had in seeing that statement, what went through your head and your heart when you saw that language? Well, the first thing is I have a 12 year old grandson. He is not a young man. He is barely a preteen, you know, I mean, he wants to think he's a grown up at a 12 as a 12 year old boy, but he is not. I have a six year old granddaughter. I can't even imagine. It just rips my heart out thinking about her being in that situation. I have a son that's now 19 that when he was, I, I think around 13 or 14, someone was trying to groom him. And that, that person, uh, a man, I was able to help some other parents be aware of what grooming looked like. And about three months later, the police were involved and he ended up in prison. So I was not a young lady. It was a crime. I was a little girl. All I kept thinking when I heard young lady was, I, I want to consider myself a young lady now as a grandmother. But at 12, I was not a young lady. It was, um, of course, it makes me a little angry. But at the same time, it's just the whole deception of all of it. So I wasn't, I wasn't shocked, but I, I definitely did not like that term. So this is the term that definitely Robert Morris used left and right. Like, oh, when I was uh, young, I was immoral. I was messing around with young lady and everything, right? And then the other light that we did, like, you know, the details in there, like, I was just like, oh, my goodness. And then Robert Morris was even sending other evangelists, right, who were staying at uh, Cindy's parents, like, oh, you know what, you know, make sure, just like, like, what, what are you doing? Like, you know, telling those, his friends, ministers, friends, according to the report, okay, allegedly, okay, to the report that Cindy put out, that, you know, Cindy was told, like, this is what you have to do, right? The other life that we did. So it's just like, man, and this is, uh, by the way, all these things were happening while Robert Morris was an evangelist, why he was, uh, why he was a pastor moving uh, places to places, right? Preaching uh, the word of God. So this wasn't like, okay, back in the day before he came to Christ. It was when he was a pastor, when he was uh, preaching as an evangelist. So very, uh, for sure, it's definitely uh, disturbing to say the least. Okay. So I know oh, Tina was saying like it bothers uh uh, mega church should it be in the same city? <laughs> or they do have like you know one of the biggest uh churches that they do have. Yeah, they definitely have uh the biggest church for sure. Yes, guys. So man, <laughs> you cannot make uh this stuff up. Okay. So uh let's listen some more, and then we can take a look at uh the other pastors who have found themselves in similar situations. If you can believe it before about the effect on your family. Um, talk a little bit about the effect in them finding out about this. This obviously went on from the time you were 12. You know, your, your story says 12 to 16. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but once your family found out, how did this affect them? Not just immediately, but throughout the decades. Uh, how much time did you say we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I say that with kind of joking, but I'm not joking. There's, there's too many things, too many facets of that. Um, I actually told when I was 17, um, so I was, it was like March of 1987 and my birthday's in January. So, you know, I know people have tried to figure out how old I was, like 12 years and how many months or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. I was 12. I was, I was not a teenager yet. And I told when I was 17 and it did go all the way through my 16th, you know, through the full year of being 16. Um, I don't recall if we saw each other during the year of 1987, those first two and a half months, but when I did tell, um, you know, one of the things I'm sure you read that was he told me the very first time, you can't tell anyone because it will ruin everything. And as a 12 year old, I had no idea what that meant. And as I, you know, grew and got older, I still didn't really know what it meant. Because when I told, I felt like it ruined everything in my life. It ruined everything in my family's life. All of them, they were very close family friends. And so was the other family that I involved in telling uh, the the lady that was my mother's close friend and her kids were our age. People have been a little confused about that story, but um, my dad was devastated. I, you know, Robert has a sermon that's been circulating the clip about how he 
he looked for little girls and there's little, you know, little girls need the love of their father and they need to be hugged and they need certain things. And if they don't get that, they're going to look somewhere else. And then, so he was describing what he looked for and how he prayed on little girls is what he did in that sermon. But I have, when I heard that, I immediately said, that wasn't me. My father is still a very loving, kind man. He was, was, and still is an incredible dad and leader in our community. And I grew up in a wonderful home, wonderful grandparents, wonderful aunts and uncles and cousins. And I, I was not lacking in any way. I was just a 12 year old little girl that didn't know any better. That didn't know that someone would do something like this. So, yes. So, so the question is, so who are those other women, right? According to his own testimony, Robert Morris, that he was actually looking, right? Searching for these um, young women to take advantage of. Eh? Who knows where those, you know, whatever else he was referring to. According to him, he gave uh, that particular testimony. Yep, so that's the situation. So now uh, we have Robert Morris over here. He gave out, uh, he was preaching, okay, it's just a short clip, okay? So the way he, <laughs> the exegesis of this uh, uh, video were quite interesting, okay? So let's uh, take a listen, guys. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom. Another, no, no, <clears throat> that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. In other words, let's, let's sleep together. But she answered him, no, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this great disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, listen to this. Please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. Now, I think that actually, that by this, I'm making an assumption that she actually loved him too. Otherwise, she wouldn't have said, just ask my dad. We can get married. We can do this the right way. And, and we don't know whether David would have done it because of the law, but he might have done it. We don't know because she, she thinks that he would, okay? So ask the king, he will Okay, that's another danger thing, okay, when people are here say, he's making assumption. <laughs> you know, there's times like, okay, we can speculate about whatever things the, the, the scripture says, right? But if you're reading the text, if you're preaching and teaching, if that's not what the text is saying, do not assume because people are going to run with your assumptions. So let's wait for him to finish and then we're going to uh, talk about it, guys. Okay. <laughs> Robert Morris is just a making assumption. <laughs> Won't withhold me. Verse 14. However, he would not heed her voice and being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. He raped her. Okay. Watch verse 15 carefully. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. He really did love her. But you're going to see how it affects you when you go into impurity. His love turned to hate. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, no, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. And then he called his servant who attended him and said, here, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. And all of the ladies said, jerk. <laughs> okay, here's what I want you to understand. When love turns to lust and lust is fulfilled, then love can turn to hate. And here's why. One of the reasons, young ladies, that he loves you is he respects you. The very thing that the world tells you to give him so you can keep him could be the very thing that causes you to lose him because he lost it. You, have, you can't, it's love and respect. 
It's all through Scripture, love and respect, love and respect. You can't love someone you don't respect. He, this is amazing to me. He loves her, but once his love turned to lust and he fulfilled his lust, we're, we're told by the Bible, he hated her exceedingly. He hated her and the hatred was more than the love. Okay, so there you have uh, Robert Morris, right? Notice what he did. He ended up, instead of him, because that's a narrative, right? It's explaining to you the things that have happened. That's what he should have done. But then he had to add in his own whatever, I, I saw Jesus, right? Adding in over there. The incident that happened, right? Uh, what happened? She ended up reporting him. So if according to assumption of Robert Morris, right? If the lady liked whatever else was happening, then why did she report uh, his brother? Okay, why did she report his brother? Because she could have just kept quiet. Remember what happened to Bathsheba and David, right? According to Deuteronomy, when those things happen, you're supposed to cry out. So uh, Bathsheba didn't cry out. It made it to be a secret. You know what I mean? It's not like she didn't know that eventually she ended up marrying David, right? but this person ended up killing your husband. So if you didn't like all these things that this guy is, <laughs> did, how come you did not say a single word about it? Okay? He never, he never did. But over here, I have like Tema, she did talk about it, right? She reported him to the brother, uh, you know, and the brother got in trouble, okay? Because David wasn't having it. It was just like, no, 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 you cannot do that, right? So uh, well, what he did to Tema was wrong, was sinful, and then Ammon got in trouble because David cut him off. Not only that, if Tema did like everything, then everything would have just ended quietly there. Nobody would have known, right? Would have, you know, just did whatever else they were doing there without anybody else knowing. But this is what happens. Like, you know, when people are adding into the text, bringing in whatever their assumptions and everything, it sounds so good and people are eating it up, but that's not what the text is, okay? That's not what the text is. The only thing that it says, like, yes, he ended up hating her. Like, yo, so why did you hate her? Because, okay, she screamed, she's telling people, is that why you're hating her? But according to the text, like, you know, uh, just stick to the to the text, please. Okay, stick to the text. But it's Robert Morris. What else do we expect? Huh? <laughs> oh, baby, <Major> grandma. <laughs> oh, welcome. Welcome. Oh, Miss Sweetie's in the house, yo. Greetings, greetings. <laughs> yeah. Robert added in the off the cuff comment to the young ladies. It's a victim. Yeah, did you see like, okay, and the ladies. <laughs> so I think they did, you know, we had a certain way of how he was uh maneuvering at that place you you can see that honestly this stuff is uh is coming for sure we cannot doubt that now guys we have um another church out here hmm. this is in missouri a missouri pastor so let's uh play this that way you guys uh can take a look i need to get the name of this guys we will no longer be silenced. Our truth will be heard. Six accusers against a former Independence Church pastor say they were sexually assaulted. Their demands for justice are on Fox 4 News at 5. And some of the accusations against former pastor Bobby Hawk date back 25 years. He since resigned as the lead pastor of Epic Church, again in Independence, also as the president of the Blue Spring School Board. A group of those potential victims took their case public today, saying that they're still scarred from the assaults in their childhood. Fox 4's Sean McDowell is working for you live outside the Jackson County Courthouse tonight where Hawk's accusers delivered a strong set of allegations. Sean? Bria, Kevin, good evening. They're also planning to file a civil lawsuit while they await the outcome of a police investigation being performed by the Blue Springs Police Department. We should point out that at least one of the alleged victims in this case says she was a minor at the time of the alleged incident. Now, as you mentioned earlier, a group of grown women, these are adults now, but they said they experienced these things in their past. They spoke out earlier today here on the courthouse steps. They also, in their accusations, they also said this will sadly continue to happen. Their words, not mine unless there is a change in the culture involving churches and alleged incidents like these. 
It's time for victims, women, men, come forward, tell your truth. Six women stepped forward on Tuesday afternoon delivering strong accusations against former Independence Church pastor Bobby Hawk. Last month, Fox 4 News shared Izzy Davis's story. She says she was 12 years old when Hawk inappropriately touched her at a party. That testimony bolstered other accusers, a half dozen of whom say they've filed police complaints against Hawk. We were manipulated by an emotional, physical, and sexual abuser. Destiny Bounds is now an attorney in the Metro. She and her sister, Danielle Hahn, say 25 years ago, Hawk assaulted both of them during his time as lead pastor at Epic Church in Independence. He resigned his position there in June, in addition to his former spot as school board president with the Blue Spring School District. Bobby's premeditated manipulation and calculated abuse stems from more than 25 years ago, and if we don't stop him, it will happen again to another generation. Han and other alleged victims say it isn't easy for child sex abuse victims to come forward. Bounds and Han join other women who say they complained to church leaders, but they were encouraged to be silent. Fox 4 News reached out to Hawk three times on Tuesday, but our voicemails weren't answered. Davis watched from an iPad since she attends school out of town. Han says she couldn't do this without seeing Davis's example of courage first. Emotions came back to me, triggers came back to me, things that I have buried for 25 years because nobody would listen to me then. And the people that did, didn't stand up for me the way that, we, that an adult should. These six women were joined by a crowd of supporters, including Pastor Wendy Minchell, who says she's been counseling some of these alleged victims amid an alleged cloud of church abuse. It's supposed to be about Jesus. It's supposed to be about love and restoration and, and forgiveness and grace. And this is all, all, none of that, none of that has taken place here. Now, Bounds and these other women would not share the nature of the lawsuit, that civil suit we mentioned that they're planning, nor would they say when it would be filed. The Blue Springs Police Department could not share an update with Fox 4 News today. Detectives, Kevin, with that agency are still hoping that if there are other victims, uh, that they'll feel comfortable with reaching out. Thank you, Sean. Sean McDowell live in downtown Kansas City tonight. So that's another story. Another pastor out there who was even uh, on a school board, right? So you're working in school, but you're a pastor, and then you are involved in some of these things. Huh? And that was 25 years ago. Obviously, also the statute of limitation has passed. That's why I guess they're just going to go for uh, the civil lawsuit. And it's just like, man, what's happening with these pastors? Like, how are they getting their position? Are they being, um, are they going through the qualifications that the Bible teaches. Is that what's happening? Who knows? I very much doubt it's, it's what's going on, honestly, because it's just like, man, <laughs> we can't be having uh, more, more and more of this. Then there's another one, okay? Another one who has uh, stepped down because of moral failure. Then they are telling the congregation not to speculate as to why he has stepped down. Like, why are you not telling the congregation why he stepped down? If you don't tell people, of course people are going to speculate, okay? Uh, Camarato, I think that's his name. All right, so let's take a look at this another pastor. Well, in Collin County, church leaders there just terminated one of their pastors at Stonebriar Community Church, sending an email to members saying that Pastor Tony Camarata confessed to a, quote, moral failure. The email goes on to say that he is deeply remorseful, but his sin disqualifies him from serving on our staff as pastor. Now, we did reach out to Stonebriar Church to get further clarification, but a spokesperson declined to say anything more. Yep, so Tony Camarada, gone. Bobby Hawk, gone. Terminated one of the pastors at Stonebriar Community Church. They sent an email to members saying Pastor Tony Camarada confessed to a, quote, moral failure. The email goes on to say that he is deeply remorseful, but his sin disqualifies him from serving on our staff as pastor. They have members who go there, people are hurt by these things, and then people will be just looking, wondering, right? It's going to bleed in mistrust because you're just going to be like suspecting things, right? You're looking at people suspecting things. A church is not supposed to be that, right? This is where we come to enjoy, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the Lord, not to be suspicious. And when people leave churches, right, they're going to other churches, 
the you, you bring that baggage with you because you're always going to be wondering like wow are there people abusing ch children at this place like is is the pastor up to up like it's just not so good so you know it is good that these things are getting exposed so hopefully it's going to cultivate um a church lifestyle that people are going to be you know a transparent lifestyle or people are just going to know their situation like you know what if you want to be a pastor you know be a good uh, somebody who has a good character okay just by a member of the church. And you might remember this comes after a separate incident that we told you about where the Gateway founder and Pastor Robert Morris was accused of sexually assaulting a child in the 80s. Welcome to today's video where we uncover the latest developments in the scandal involving Robert Morris, the former pastor of Gateway Church in Southlake, Texas. Recently released documents have intensified public scrutiny and outrage by revealing that Morris attorney, G. Shelby Sharpie, blamed the victim, Cindy Clemisher, for the inappropriate sexual contact that occurred when she was young. These revelations have not only cast a dark shadow over Morris and his legal team, but have also prompted significant changes within the church and sparked a broader conversation about the handling of abuse allegations in religious institutions. Join us as we delve deeper into this unfolding story and its far-reaching implications. Told me, he said, hey, come in my room before you go to bed tonight. I want to talk to you. Cindy Clemisher's recent television appearance, where she bravely shared her past, has ignited a significant public response. Adding to the outrage are documents from 2007 that have recently surfaced. These documents reveal that Robert Morris's attorney, J. Shelby Sharpie, tried to shift the blame for the inappropriate sexual contact onto Clemisher, suggesting that she was at fault for entering Morris' bedroom and getting into bed with him. Despite Sharpie's admission that Morris should not have allowed the situation to occur, the attempt to place responsibility on a child has only intensified public anger. This blame... Shifting strategy has been widely condemned, further highlighting the deeply flawed handling of the case by Morris and his legal team. The public's reaction underscores the need for accountability and justice for Cindy Clemisher, bringing additional scrutiny to how such cases are managed and the importance of protecting and supporting victims. Sharpe, who also served as personal attorney for former Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary President Paige Patterson, made these claims in correspondence cited by NBC News. He suggested to Clemisher's attorney that she was at fault for the abuse she suffered when she tried to sue Morris, the founder of Gateway Church. It was your client who initiated the inappropriate behavior by entering my client's bedroom and getting into bed with him, something my client should not have allowed to happen, Sharp wrote in a letter dated February 6, 2007. Clemisher had requested $50,000 from Morris to pay for her counseling. Additionally, Sharpie claimed that Clemisher had acted inappropriately with two other adult men in the house as a child. Gentina Drummond, Clemish's attorney at the time, and now Oklahoma's attorney general, confirmed the correspondence to NBC News, but declined to provide further comment. Sharper, who no longer represents Morris, told the news network that he did not recall the settlement offer, and denied knowing that Clemisher was a child when the abuse began. I never remember seeing that, Sharpie said, referring to the letter. I can tell you that the letters that you found speak for themselves, he added. I won't say anything more than those letters, because they speak for themselves. This attempt to place responsibility on a child has drawn severe criticism and intensified public outrage, highlighting the problematic handling of the case by Morris and his legal team. The public's reaction underscores the need for accountability and justice for Cindy Clemisher. In a 2007 correspondence, Robert Morris' former attorney, J. Shelby Sharp, claimed that Cindy Clemisher acted inappropriately with two other men who stayed in her home between 1982 and 1982 and 1987, when she was between the ages of 12 and 17, according to NBC News. The letter noted that Clemisher confessed her conduct to Glenda Faulkner, a woman who attended Shady Grove Church near Fort Worth, Texas, in the 1980s, where Morris was also a pastor. However, Clemisher told NBC News that two other men had touched her inappropriately in her home as a child, but she did not initiate these incidents. Clemisher recounted a specific occasion when she was 13 years old, alleging that Morris told her to go into a bedroom in her childhood home, where another traveling evangelist was staying. Once inside the room, she said the man began to kiss her, but stopped himself telling her she was too young. Another incident occurred in 1986, when Clemisher said a man staying with her family climbed on top of her while she was sleeping on a sofa bed next to his three-year-old daughter. She believed he was going to rape her, but stopped suddenly. These revelations have intensified public outrage, drawing severe criticism for Sharpie's attempt to shift blame onto a child and highlighting the problematic handling of the case by Morris and his legal team. The public's reaction underscores the need for accountability and justice for Cindy Clemisher. And we begin tonight in Salt Lake, where Pastor Robert Morris is no longer part of the church he founded. Gateway Church says Morris resigned today after a woman publicly claimed he sexually abused her when she was 12 years old. Robert Morris, the founder of Gateway Church, resigned in June after admitting to inappropriate behavior. This resignation came amid mounting allegations and public scrutiny. 
Morris's mission was seen by many as an attempt to mitigate the situation, but it did little to quell the outrage, especially given the details of the allegations. Cindy Clemisher has consistently stated that the incidents began when she was prepubescent, which adds a grave dimension to the accusations against Morris. Her claims suggest a prolonged period of inappropriate behaviour that began when she was as young as 12, a fact that sharply contrasts with Morris's vague term of inappropriate behaviour. This discrepancy raises questions about the extent of Morris's acknowledgement of his actions, and whether his admission was an attempt to downplay the severity of the allegations. Morris's resignation and admission have not satisfied the public's demand for accountability. The term inappropriate is seen as a minimization of the alleged incidents, particularly given Clemish's consistent account of being a child during the incidents. This has led uh, the gateway a scandal demands change in 21st century mega churches, right? So somebody put out uh, Sophia Nelson against some of the good points as far as the solution that can be done. Okay, tragically, SA is nothing new in the church. Understandably, global focus has been on the decades of SA by pressing the Catholic faith. Those crimes, once uncovered, resulted in hundreds of millions, billions worldwide of dollars in settlements to families. The closing of parishes and some priests being criminally prosecuted. The scandal in Boston in early 2000 rocked the Catholic Church globally. So now, obviously, we have, um, so now these things is just not, you know, just the Catholics, right? We have now, you know, evangelicals have entered in this thing. So it just shows you like sin is everywhere. You don't have to be in a Catholic to have these particular sins. But yes, that was a big story during uh, that time. I remember Catholics, right? A lot of... Um, priests were implicated uh, during that time. Spread criticism and calls for more explicit acknowledgement of wrongdoing. The revelations about Morris's attorney, J. Shelby Sharp, attempting to shift blame onto Clemisher further complicate the legal and ethical landscape of the case. Sharp's defense strategy, which included suggesting that Clemisher initiated inappropriate behavior, has been widely condemned as an unethical attempt to deflect responsibility from Morris. This blame, Shifting not only fails to address the power dynamics and the age difference, but also perpetuates a culture of victim, blaming. Morris' resignation and the surrounding scandal have had a significant impact on the gateway church community. Faith communities often struggle with allegations of misconduct within their leadership, as it can lead to a crisis of trust and faith among members. The way the church handles these allegations, whether they prioritize transparency and accountability or attempt to protect their leadership, can deeply affect its reputation and the congregation's trust. This case highlights broader issues of institutional accountability within religious organizations. It underscores the importance of having robust mechanisms to address allegations of misconduct, including independent investigations and support systems for victims. The handling of Clemisher's case by Morris and his legal team exemplifies how institutions can fail victims when they prioritize their reputation over justice. The public outcry following these revelations emphasizes the need for justice and better support systems for victims of misconduct. Clemish's courage in coming forward has shed light on the systemic issues that allow such behaviours to be minimised or ignored. There is a strong call for legal and societal changes to ensure that victims are heard, supported, and given the justice they deserve. Robert Morris' resignation, and the details of his admission of inappropriate behaviour, juxtaposed with Cindy Clemish's consistent and detailed accusations, reveal a troubling picture of how serious allegations can be downplayed. The backlash against Morris and his legal team's handling of the case highlights the urgent need for more ethical and transparent responses to such allegations within religious and other institutions. The situation calls for a re-evaluation of how accusations of misconduct are managed, ensuring that the focus remains on supporting victims and holding perpetrators accountable. As the investigation into Robert Morris's actions and Gateway Church's handling of the allegations continues, the revelations of victim, blaming and mishandling of the case have only deepened the scandal. The Church now faces a crucial period of introspection and reform to address these serious issues and regain the trust of its congregation and the broader public. Yep, I thought uh, that was a good summary that they put out in just detailing the things that have um, taken place and transpired out there at Gateway Church. So yes, but you know, continue to pray for the people who go to that church. And even the, usually when issues like this happen, when people leave the church, they don't want to be part of the church, right? Even Cindy Kremisher in the interview, she actually shared that she doesn't go to church. She still prays, she still uh, reads her Bible, but she's not a member of any church. So that tells you, right, the mistrust that people are going to have with the church. Not all churches are like this, right? That there must be, you know, there's good people at Gateway. 
but because this is what happened uh because Robert Morris did these things he's put his uh you know the church that he quote unquote founded in a, in jeopardy that's why even now the church is just like you know what if people want to talk about these things just go talk to uh Robert and just go talk to Cindy so we get it we understand why people just be like oh we don't want to have anything to do with the church right but we know the church is the bride of Christ it's a pure bride of Christ Christ died for his church and he's coming back for his church there are good faithful churches out there there are men who are labeling for the kingdom and trying to stay above reproach so it's like people like Robert Morris they make it bad for uh for such leadership and for uh for such pastors right so we want like you know if these things have happened we want you know things to be reported things should be should happen according to a uh, rightful manner okay we don't want people to be bringing false accusations okay we don't want to be bringing false accusations and when these accusations are brought forth you know things must be handled well right we just don't want to ra 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 me too or church too and then forgoing the scriptures we want justice right biblical justice justice that honors god it's going to be truthful and honest So Gateway says it's in none of their business, okay? <laughs> the inappropriate and the inappropriate relationship Robert with Cindy took place more than a decade before Gateway Church was started. Questions regarding Robert and Cindy should be addressed to them. That is all that I had for you guys today. I hope you find this to be informative to you. Be sure to subscribe to my channel, follow me on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook and X. Until next time, remember to be in the now thank you